The world is old and the powers are weary. The god at the door of night has fallen and the great enemy of the world has come back from the timeless void. The shadow has awakened the great evils to regain dominion over Ardar. Darkness shall cover the land if not for the deeds of a small fellowship of elf friends. Join the players of this Dungeons & Dragons campaign as they fulfill the events of the Dagor Daggeron prophecy and strive with Morgoth on the plains of Valinor. Welcome to the Undying Lands in Part 3 of the Inglorian Bastards trilogy, Trials of the Valor. All right, welcome everybody to episode 101 of the Inglorian Bastards podcast. Uh, today uh, we're kicking off part three of the of the trilogy, um, and there's no better way to do this uh, than to to have a world renowned Tolkien scholar on, on the podcast. Uh, and I have the, the honor of of having Dr. Verlin Flieger tonight with me. Um, uh, among other things, Dr. Flieger is a uh, professor emerita in the Department of English uh, at the University of Maryland. She's a professor at Signum University. She is the author of many books, the editor of many books, um, uh, and of course our focus is on um, books about Tolkien and, and essays about Tolkien and his uh, legendarium. Uh, she is co-founder and editor of the Tolkien Studies Journal um, as well. She has written uh, a few young adult novels, uh, and is three-time winner of the Mythopoeic, uh, or one of the Mythopoeic Awards. Uh, and the list just goes on and on. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you uh, for coming tonight, Dr. Flieger. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I, I guess um, let's let's start off um, like you do, um, like, like I do on my podcast and like you've done on past podcasts. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit about you um, and, and how you first came to Tolkien. Well, okay. Um, I think you've already told a little bit about me. <laughs> a little bit, yes. I spent the last 40 years or so teaching mostly Tolkien-related stuff in universities. Mm -hmm. I first, gosh, I've told this story so many times, <laughs> I first learned about Tolkien in the winter of 1956-57, somewhere around December or January, I don't remember quite which, um, but it was very shortly after the publication of uh, the Return of the King, the final volume. Mm -hmm. And I was working at the Folger Shakespeare Library downtown in D.C. And one of my co-workers was British, and her brother, back in England, had just sent her this extraordinary three-volume novel uh, by somebody that none of us at the Folger or indeed, I think, in the United States at that time, had ever heard of um, by some guy named Tolkien. <laughs> some guy, yeah. Oh, who knew? I didn't even know he was uh, an Oxford Don. All I knew was that he had written this book. Well, anyway, she gave it to all of us. We all read it. We passed it around. We decided we really loved it. Um, we all liked Strider. We all thought Aragorn was kind of boring. Um, <laughs> and that was really pretty much it until um, eight or nine years later when my oldest son, at that time about eight, uh, came down with a terrible case of poison ivy. His face swelled up. He had no nose, no eyes, no mouth. He couldn't play outside. He couldn't, uh -oh. he couldn't watch television. He couldn't do anything, poor guy. And in desperation, I reached for a nearby book, opened it up, and started to read when Mr. Bilbo Baggins of Bag End Hobbiton announced. And we were off in mm -hmm. the story of Bilbo and his birthday party. And it held my son's attention. It got the attention of my other two kids. I actually finished up the summer by reading them the whole book, and that got me reinterested in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was back in graduate school by that time and teaching 
low-level courses at Catholic University, and I thought that this was the 70s, that they might be interested in a course in fantasy, which was my clever way of getting Tolkien <laughs> into the course. <laughs> and I proposed the course. It was accepted. I was right. It was the right time for it. It was immensely popular. We had to add sections, and that is really um, the way it started. That's a great story, and I think it probably resonates with a lot of people. I myself, right now, um, I have an eight-year-old daughter that you know we just finished the, the Hobbit, and we're getting into the Fellowship now, and you know we're studying the uh, Atlas and Middle Earth at night, right before she goes to bed, looking at the places that we've talked about. But I'm curious, um, how did you? What what was it about fantasy that that um, that really piqued your interest and made you want to sort of? delve into that, you know, for 40 years. <laughs> well, I didn't know at the time that I was going to delve for 40 years. <clears throat> and I also wasn't interested in it as fantasy. That was just my clever way of getting it included in the course. Mm -hmm. But what struck me about it was it's, <laughs> paradoxically, it's reality. It's solidity. It's thereness. Um, it may have had hobbits and elves and dwarves, but it also had bread and cheese and mushrooms and rocks and forests and a very concrete and believable world. And characters that you could relate to. It. Yeah. Oh, characters that I loved. And the four hobbits, uh, particularly Frodo. Um, I wasn't so much captured by by the by the magic of it. There really isn't a right. lot of magic in the Lord of the Rings, and there really isn't a lot of fantasy. I was thinking of this earlier today. Um, you know, just the subtlety. Uh, with which Gandalf says certain things, and you're thinking to yourself, "How could you possibly know this?" Right? No, that's the magic, right? They don't, you know, he, he doesn't elaborate on it too much. But I think that's what piques the imagination. For me, it's going into that world, going into it deeply, completely. Oh, I don't think I had ever been so conscious of being in a book as I was when I read The Lord of the Rings, so conscious that when I got to the last page and stopped crying, I had to go back to the beginning right away and start again because I wanted to hang out with those guys. Yeah. <laughs> I, I obviously love the story. Like like so many people in this world, we wanna we wanna be in that world. We wanna write in that world. We wanna we wanna compose our own stories in that world. So I guess I'll kind of uh, I want to segue into my next question. But the, the goal for this evening is to kind of expand our knowledge on on um, what we've already talked about on the podcast and to go sort of deeper into our storyline. And I, I think you might actually be the perfect person to go in. To, into some details on some of these things because I want to share some titles from your book. You have two books of, uh, of essays, of collected essays um, from essays you've, you've written uh, throughout the years. Um, and I just want, I want to read a few of these titles and, and just, I mean, they're, they're creative and interesting. Um, here's one, uh, The Body in Question, The Unhealed Wounds of Frodo Baggins. Who doesn't want to know more about that? Uh, Drowned Lands, right? discussing Numenor, um, the curious incident of the dream at the Barrow, memory and reincarnation in Middle Earth. Um, I mean, there's just so many, and there's one, <laughs> there's one that I just caught here, uh, how trees behave or do they? <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> That's a great title. 
So I, like I said, I think you might be the most um, ideal person to talk about some of these things. But as I was reading the essays, doing my interviews and in doing my research, you know, I've come across the titles of several other uh, pieces of work. And as a, as a casual Tolkien reader, my listener might not be familiar with some of these things. So I was wondering, there are, there are four uh, titles that I want to bring up to you, and and I was I was hoping you could kind of give us the ten thousand foot view of some of them, um, uh, if you're able. The um uh, the the first two are the sort of unfinished, I believe, uh, time travel stories called the Lost Road and the Notion Club Papers, and the last two are um, sort of the the collected letters of Tolkien and something that he wrote called On Fairy Stories. Could you help us better understand those? Um, well, I can try. <laughs> oh, order. Um, if we start with the Lost Road and the Notion Club papers, would that be a good place? Yeah, that's that's a great place. And, <clears throat> and um, I'm sure we could probably talk for four hours on each of these things. But, you know... When, when I was reading the essays, if I, if I hadn't had some clue as to what these, these things were, I, th- I think it would have been harder to sort of really go down that rabbit hole. Well, they are, um, they are oblique in some respects. The Notion Club papers doesn't really tell you very much. The Lost Road tries to tell you more about itself. Um, but I think we got to go back just a little bit, Jared. Sure. And remember, remind ourselves that Tolkien's whole literary endeavor, and that started, the ambition started while he was still in school, and the actuality began when he just got back from the war in 1916-1917, he was interested in the lack of English indigenous mythology. Mm -hmm. When the Greeks had mythology, the Romans had it, the Irish had it, um, the Indians had it, uh, but there was no specifically English mythology. And his ambition was to fill in that gap, to write his version of what the English mythology might have been um, before Christianity arrived. Mm -hmm. And the lost road is the road back. He was great friends, as you probably know, with C.S. Lewis. And he and Lewis had this sort of um, agreement between them that since there wasn't enough of the kind of literature they liked, they'd have to write it themselves. And Lewis, they tossed up, and Lewis got space travel, and Tolkien got time travel. Lewis Hmm. produced the three-volume space trilogy in very short order, and Tolkien sat down and said, how do you travel in time? And that's not as easy as you might suppose. He ruled out a time machine. Uh, He ruled out any kind of of super mechanical device, Uh, but he thought that you might be able to go back through a memory which, of course, is all about the past, and that dreams might unlock that part of your mind so that you could travel that otherwise lost road. And that's what the first of the two unfinished stories is about, about two modern-day Englishmen, a father and a son, and then another son, um, who are supposed to make connection with their Numenorean selves. Ah, uh, there's a word we recognize. Yeah. Uh, and so they talk about how do you go back? What's the way? One of the characters says, I would like to walk 
in the past as men walk on long roads. And the Lost Road was his first attempt at trying to put that into some kind of coherent form. It only lasted for three or four chapters. He abandoned it. Uh, he was also working on The Hobbit at the same time. And um, that sort of took precedence. And he didn't pick up the idea again until, oh, roughly 1944, 45, with the Notion Club papers, which took the same idea, but instead of a father and son, had a society of English professors based on his academic gang, the Inklings, and mm -hmm. they stood around debating how do you travel in time, in space, um, and he writes himself to the point where two of his Englishmen start to have dreams about a mysterious past that their waking minds are unfamiliar with. Um, that gets published or pseudo published um, as the Notion Club papers. And it's the same idea, but worked on a more sophisticated level of modern day people being pulled back to their ancestral selves. And that's what the Notion Club papers really is. It's a shame he never finished it. Well, I'm I'm noticing a um, kind of a, a trend with Tolkien where he has a an idea that he doesn't fully abandon, and he comes back to it and changes it and uh -huh. you know, develops it. <laughs> We've seen that in some of his other writings. We have the letters are a gold mine, a treasure trove. They're not the collected letters; they're the selected letters. So it's not everything and new letters keep popping up. But it's mostly about the writing of the Lord of the Rings and it gives a lot of insights into what Tolkien thought he was doing. Well, are these the letters, um, sort of the, you said selected letters, but are they um, are they from the, the various libraries, uh, the, um, sort of the shared library of Marquette and um, Bodleian? Um, not when they were published, no. I think that um, many of them were in possession of Tolkien's family oh. and were contributed to this volume. Um, more of them are to Christopher than to anyone else in the published uh, version. And it was he, I think, who, um, who commissioned Humphrey Carpenter to edit them. Mm -hmm. um, they're now at the Bodleian. But I believe even now they're kind of restricted. You can't just walk in off the street. Start. No, I, I can uh, I can vouch for that. I've I've contacted the library and tried to go see them, and uh, I, I was told that I need to be a researcher. <laughs> Is this a good time to transition to on fairy stories? Oh, uh, certainly. That's an incalculably important element in Tolkien's writing. It just it its centrality to the way he wrote and to what he wrote cannot be overestimated. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very important reference tool. Uh, he first gave it as a lecture in 1939, I think, uh, at St. Andrews. And he then extensively revised and extended it. And it's been published several times. It was published in essays presented to Charles Williams, and then Christopher edited a whole volume of Tolkien's essays, of which this is one. But it has some very important concepts that are central to Tolkien's work.
it's extremely complex, very dense. Um, it does have a shape or tone. Should be doesn't think so. Um, but the major, the major concepts in it are the notion of the interdependence of language and mythology. And mythology is always the sort of ever-present background to Tolkien's writing. He never stopped writing his mythology for England. Mm -hmm. uh, and The Hobbit got pulled into it, and The Lord of the Rings got pulled into it, and then the mythology got pulled into The Lord of the Rings so that they became kind of intertwined. The idea is that a people's words create the world they live in. <laughs> that the words you use are not just odd descriptive counters. They say a lot about where you think you are and what you think about it. <laughs> When Tolkien first discovered this, he was um, just going up to Oxford. He ran across a mythology that he'd never heard of before, and it absolutely bowled him over. It was the mythology of the Finns, and it was called Kalevala. And he read what he thought was a very bad translation of it. And at that time, all these ideas were sort of coming together, and he thought, well, of course it's bad. It's a translation. The only way to read it is to have the actual Finnish words. So he tried to teach himself Finnish. Uh, uh, it was, <laughs> he said he was repulsed with heavy losses. <laughs> um, but so the, the effort to do that, shows how important it was to him to enter into the world by means of its language. And to understand. Yeah. Now, is that where his, his love of, of um, and his, the beginnings of Quenya came in? Well, he'd been making up languages since he was a little kid. Um, but it may be the very, very early tentative beginnings of what turned into Quenya. Mm -hmm. He wrote one of the stories in Kalevala in his own words to try to make it more his, called the story of Kulervo, a very tragic story. Uh, but when he did it, if you read it, you can see he's already trying to make it his, trying to take it from the finish mythology and work it around so it's his words, his language mm -hmm. that is expressing the story. Well, that's what On Fairy Stories tells you. The other thing it talks about that's really important is what fairy stories give you. Um, and what they give you is a happy ending brought about by the U catastrophe. It was a word he made up. The U catastrophe? E U C A T A S T R O P H E. U catastrophe. The good catastrophe. Huh. The thing that looks like it's going to make everything go to hell, and at the last minute it turns around and everybody pulls through and we all live happily ever after. Uh -huh. Um. And that turn at the precipice of disaster, he felt, was the, the thing that really, that was the kernel of the fairy story. The moment when you catch your breath, when you think, oh, it's going to be all right. She's going to wake up. He's going to kiss her. <laughs> uh, you know, all of the fairy stories that, that you know about, Sleeping Beauty and Snow White and all of those. Um, 
And of course, he then proceeded to write the greatest new catastrophic moment in 20th century literature at the Cracks of Doom. I wondered if you were going to bring up Mount Doom, yes. Oh, it, it's got it all. You get to that point, you can't believe that Frodo was going to claim the ring. He does, and at the moment of total disaster, when the whole brick wall is about to fall on your head, up comes Gollum, grabs the finger, bites it off, falls into the cracks of doom. The ring is destroyed and Frodo is saved. Right. It's one of the greatest moments in, uh, in literary history, I think. I agree. But you can find it, you can see Tolkien's interest in it in On Fairy Stories. The essay that is the sort of opposite number to On Fairy Stories is Beowulf, The Monsters and the Critics. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Which was a lecture he had given about two years earlier. Um, and that takes a completely different approach. It's about Beowulf, which is the great early English epic. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also about doomed courage, about fortitude in the face of disaster. It's about death. It's about mortality. And more than anything, it's about the importance of the monsters. In Tolkien's day, the general literary view was that it's a great poem, but dragons? Really? <laughs> you know, couldn't they have written about real people? And Tolkien said, yes, dragons, really. <laughs> That's what it's about. Because the monsters can embody the dark. The fact that we are all gonna die. Oh, they're not trivial. They're not lighthearted. They're serious. Oh, because they can say what it needs to be said so much better than a story of mere mortal heroism. You fight against the dark and you lose. So the two essays sort of balance out uh, the toggle in Tolkien's works between the doomed and the eucatastrophic. Wow. Well, it looks like I have some, uh, some, some reading to do. <laughs> oh, I hope you enjoy it. I definitely will. Um, and, and it seems like these are turning up, um, you know, everybody that I talk to and everything that I read, my library is ever expanding with each interview that I do. And I, and <laughs> well, I have, quiz. Yeah. Be, <laughs> Though this marks the end of the episode, the road goes ever on. Until next time, join us at longwinded.one and consider giving us a review on Apple Music, Spotify, or really whichever platform you choose. 